Pox viruses are the largest viruses that we are going to talk about by size. They also have a really large genome. It's a double-stranded DNA genome of approximately 190,000 base pairs. One thing that's really unique about pox viruses is that they carry a lot of their own enzymes. And that feature is not what's unique. What's unique for pox viruses is why they have to carry their own enzymes. So we can see here in this cartoon of the virion, the core of the viral particle has viral DNA and proteins. So what makes pox viruses unique, especially among DNA viruses, is that pox viruses replicate in the host cytoplasm. If you look at infected host cells under the microscope, you'll see a lot of inclusion bodies in the cytoplasm that represent sites of uh, viral replication. So if we think about how viruses normally replicate, DNA viruses normally replicate, normally the DNA from a DNA virus will enter the nucleus, and in the nucleus, the host DNA polymerase will help replicate the DNA, the host RNA polymerase will help, tra help transcribe uh, the viral DNA into RNA, but with pox viruses, what we're looking at is they don't enter the nucleus. So there is no DNA polymerase in the cytoplasm. There is no RNA polymerase in the cytoplasm. So these viruses have to bring, at bare minimum, they have to bring their own DNA polymerase and their own RNA polymerase uh, for transcription and replication to occur. I kind of already spoiled this, what is unique among DNA viruses, the fact that you have replication in the cytoplasm. Pox viruses don't enter the nucleus. And you can think about that also in terms of, we talked about a lot of viruses that can be oncogenic, right? They can cause cancer. We don't typically see pox viruses as cancer causing viruses. So why might that be? We're going to talk about two pox viruses. Um, only one of them is discussed in any real detail in your text. The first, uh, and the one that is covered in more detail in your text, is smallpox. Remember, these pox viruses have very large genomes. Approximately 30% of the pox virus genome actually helps encode genes for immune evasion. The virus is inhaled. Uh, generally, or it can be transmitted via scabs, that's a lot less effective. Think about why. Go back a couple slides, look at the biology, right, in that cartoon, look at the biology of the virus. Why might it be less effective to be transmitted through scabs? When they get in, uh, they will replicate in the upper respiratory tract, get into the lymphatic system and cause a primary viremia. You can then have hemorrhage of small vesicle, vessels in the dermis and that leads to the rash and the pox. It can get to other organs as well um, and then that cycle will continue. When we talk about smallpox, smallpox only infects humans. Um, there are no animal reservoirs or vectors, so it's a human-to-human -human disease. The other interesting thing about smallpox is that there is only one serotype. So it doesn't have, like COVID-19 has tons and tons of versions. Uh, the flu has tons and tons of versions. Smallpox doesn't, it has one. And when you have a situation like that where it's not changing anything, it's not changing its outer coat or anything like that, it makes it a lot easier to have protection. So immunization against smallpox protected. There wasn't going to be a new strain coming around that could get around that vaccination. The... Um, Symptoms and signs of the disease are pretty straightforward, uh, visible pustules, and that helped 
people identify who was infected so that they could be quarantined and isolated and that any of their contacts could be vaccinated. We have a very effective vaccine against smallpox. It is based mostly on um, cowpox. So there's some cross reactivity with the different pox viruses. So vaccination with cowpox uh, tended to not make people very sick, but it protected against the far more severe infection of smallpox. The vaccine uh, was relatively stable, fairly inexpensive and easy to administer, which made it far more accessible to people in developing countries. At the site of vaccination, patients would typically develop a, a single large lesion uh, that could leave a scar, and this was indicative of a successful vaccination. So you may, depending on your age and your parents' age, um, you may be able to see the smallpox scars on their arms, or if you have grandparents that are still living, perhaps theirs. Um, for people that were born in other countries, they were vaccinating even later. So I have people who are my age that still have smallpox scars that were born in other countries. So the smallpox scar was, again, indicative of a very successful vaccination. Finally, what we had with smallpox was a concerted worldwide effort to get rid of this infection. Um, and all of these factors combined, the fact that there was no animal reservoir, the fact that there was only one serotype, the fact that we had a great vaccination, the fact that we could quarantine and isolate people, all of that worked together to make smallpox the first disease that was ever eradicated from the planet. There were two forms of disease. Uh, patients could either get variola major Variola is the name for smallpox. It's the variola virus, which had anywhere from a 15 to 40% mortality. Uh, it's not like serious chickenpox. It's a very, very dangerous infection. The more minor version of disease that people might experience uh, was variola minor, which had only a 1% mortality. So you can see with this patient here, those smallpox lesions, this doesn't look anything like chickenpox. These lesions are dense and they're all over the body. The vaccination campaign, the worldwide vaccination campaign, began in 1967. At this point, um, smallpox was considered pretty much eliminated from what we now consider to be developed countries like the US, um, most parts of Europe, etc. The last naturally acquired infection was documented in 1977. There was a single patient in Somalia who was identified as the last naturally acquired infection. Um, there were some laboratory acquired infections after this one. It's actually a really sad story um, but I'll let you look that up if you're interested. And the disease was declared eradicated from the planet in 1980. Prior to uh, the development of actual vaccines, there was a process called variolation that actually worked really well, um, but was rather risky in order to get rid of the infection or to prevent the infection. And so what people would do is take, it's going to sound gross and so sorry, they would take scabs from patients who'd had smallpox and they would let them dry out um, and then they would blow them up the nose of uh, somebody who'd never had smallpox before. And the idea would be that hopefully by drying them, there would be very few um, infectious virions because when you dry smallpox viruses, they lose their infectivity. 
um, and that the patient would then develop a minor case of smallpox, variola minor, and then would be protected from a more dangerous infection later in life. So it worked really well um, because, again, if you did get that minor infection, you were protected from infection forever, but there's no guarantee that you would get the minor infection. So this is a case from 2007. A woman visited a public health clinic in Alaska because pain from vaginal tears had increased over the course of 10 days. However, she didn't have any fever, itching, or painful urination. Uh, clinical examination showed two shallow ulcers, redness, and vaginal discharge. Um, she didn't have any lymph node swelling in her groin. A viral specimen from the lesion was identified by the CDC as the vaccine strain of vaccinia virus. So vaccinia, right? cowpox, vaca, if you know your Latin roots. Uh, presence of the virus was identified by a variation of PCR, which uh, showed the characteristic vaccinia DNA fragments from the genome. Although the woman routinely insisted on using condoms during sex, a condom broke during vaginal intercourse with a new male sex partner. The male partner was in the U.S. military and had been vaccinated for smallpox three days before initiating his relationship with the woman. Virus from the lesion somehow either got on the condom or into the site. Uh, military and other personnel are receiving vaccinia immunization uh, immunization for protection against weaponized smallpox. This increases the potential for unintentional transmission of the vaccinia virus. Other cases of vaccine-related vaccinia infection have included infants and individuals with atopic dermatitis, which is a type of inflammatory skin condition, who had more severe consequences. So this is one of those cases where you know, they always tell you if you hear hoofbeats, think horses. Well, in this case, if you hear hoofbeats, think zebra. It's cowpox, which is really weird, but um, a very interesting case. So I told you that smallpox had been eradicated from the planet. So why in the world would we continue to vaccinate? It's gone. It's gone with me doing air quotes around gone. So there are stockpiles of smallpox um, that still exist. Theoretically, they should be in two places. One, at the CDC in Atlanta, and two, at an institute called Vector in Russia. Let's just say, and this is, you know, not trying to say the U.S. is any better because I'm going to talk about us in just a second. Uh, relationship between the USSR and the US wasn't terribly strong in the 1980s. And I would argue that security also probably wasn't terribly strong at uh, some of these institutions. And I think we might be naive to think that samples of the virus didn't get up and walk away, we'll say. And I told you I'm not trying to say the U.S. is any better because relatively recently, I want to say within the past five to ten years, um, they found smallpox vials at the NIH in, in Maryland. These vials had been left out at, I believe, room temperature, so it's not like the virus was viable anymore. But it's not like we had any better, any better results because the virus was in a place that it shouldn't have been. So theoretically, it should only be in two places. In reality, it is possible that other countries could have their own stockpile of the virus.